as geeks take on dictators. We will resist until our dying breath. Bloggers turn dissidents. Egyptians have set themselves on fire. And social networks root for social justice. Governments are going cyber. We will ensure that these networks are secure. Spying on their citizens, erecting firewalls like iron curtains, and closing down websites. We ask, is cyber-generated change virtual or real? This is it. Hello and welcome to Empire, coming to you from the prestigious School of Journalism at Columbia University. Information is power. And in the age of information, YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter have become the new weapons of mass mobilization, transforming entire societies from Iran, Tunisia, and Egypt through the favelas in Rio and Bethlehem refugee camps. People can see the difference, imagine the alternative, and organize for a better future. After more than two decades of rule by Tunisia's one revolution man, has marked its place in history. Ali. Tunisia is now a country in chaos. But it didn't happen overnight. <laughs> and weeks before the world's mainstream media woke up to the story, tweets, photos, and videos began popping up on the internet from Tunisia, warning of trouble to come. A fruit and vegetable seller from Sidi Bouzid had set himself on fire on December 18th, and suddenly, reactions on the Twitterverse were exploding. Following the hashtag Sidi Bouzid, I called up hundreds of photos and videos showing students protesting, police abuses, and sporadic gunfire. As the messages went viral, protests broke out across the world showing solidarity with Tunisia. Tunisia unrest makes waves in Lausanne. Demo Hashtag tomorrow to the Tunisian embassy in London. A flash mob is planned in Berlin on Saturday. The beginning of a revolution was unfolding and the mainstream media was just beginning to catch up. There are no reporters in Tunisia to tell us what's really happening. About this sooner. Mass media has totally failed. Terrorism equals lots of media coverage. Democratic revolution equals little media coverage. Tunisia's government began hacking into and deleting Facebook accounts. Protesters called for help from hacktivist groups. An unprecedented crackdown on social media. Censorship should get in touch with hacktivists and We really need a local hashtag version of Anonymous in the Arab world. And soon enough, another hashtag appeared across the networks. Anonymous. The Tunisian government has decided it wants to restrict the freedoms of their own people. In doing so, the Tunisian government has made itself an enemy of Anonymous. Within a matter of hours, Anonymous launched Operation Tunisia. Paralyzing the president's site, several key ministries, and the stock exchange. The group also shared a cyber war survival guide, sharing cables from WikiLeaks documenting Ben Ali's corruption, tips on running from cops, and proxy sites to access Facebook and Twitter. The government quickly countered with a phishing operation, stealing Facebook and email passwords to spy on activists and obliterate online dissent. But tweets continued to spread, documenting a society's breakdown. The internet is reportedly cut off from city People are creating barricades to protect their neighbors. Students demonstrating in Klebia, 50 miles Injured east. young man shot by police in his back in Kofsa. For a full week, I watched the story unfold online, speaking to activists, using Facebook and Twitter as protests turned bloody. And on January 12th, with Ben Ali's regime on the verge of collapse, Time magazine finally found the story. But the social networks had the best coverage. A new power structure had emerged, and protests had spread to other countries and governments scrambled to buy time. Algeria steps up grain imports. King Abdallah of Jordan sacks government. Plus free food for a year to keep calm. But the anger had already rooted itself inside Arab minds. Through social networks, Egyptians had began drawing connections in late December. Egyptians should copy Tunisia revolt. Toppling their dictator. That will start a chain reaction in the Arab world. Tunisia solidarity demo on Sunday. Inspired by Tunisia's success, finally, the fear factor had broken. January 25th, a public holiday in Egypt marking the day in 1952 that saw police back up the Egyptian people's resistance against British occupation. 
As people organized, they drew upon Tunisia's success sharing pamphlets on peaceful protesting and self-defense. They made plans to circumvent police barricades, quickly capturing the world's attention. But Mubarak also learned from Tunisia. On January 27, just as President Obama appeared live on YouTube answering questions from the public, Egypt's president took the unprecedented step of shutting down the internet. But he was too late. The World Wide Web was against him. The accounts of police abuse and violence circulated online, including footage that the Associated Press picked up showing what some have called Egypt's Neda moment. A coalition of volunteers, organizations, and activists set up platforms to get the message out. Egyptians, email me if you want to post info on Twitter. To break Elta the block Howie. on Twitter, use this proxy. Numbers for legal aid and requesting lawyers. Zero one zero. Even journalists in Egypt used their cell phones to send tweets to friends who relayed their messages. Internet still down in Egypt. We'll continue to tweet. She is safe. She just doesn't have internet access. So I'm tweeting on her behalf. To stop any news getting out, the government went after the media. Journalists were detained, and the U.S. government, which had been waffling in its response, turned to Twitter to make their voice heard. We are concerned by the shutdown of Al Jazeera in Egypt and the arrest of its correspondents. Egypt must be open and the reporters released. Thirty minutes later, our journalists were released, showing that even governments can use social media to get things done. Joining me to discuss the challenge of new media to governments and govern to the dictators and the dictated is Carl Bernstein. You are a Pulitzer Prize winning reporter who famously helped oust a president. Amy Goodman, best-selling author and the dame of multimedia's democracy now. Professor Emily Bell, director of digital journalism here at Columbia University and formerly at the British Guardian newspaper. Claire Sharkey, you're a professor, author, and guru of new media. And last but not least, Yvni Morozov, cyber skeptic and author of The Net Delusion, The Dark Side of Internet Freedom. Yvgeny, you're web skeptic, internet skeptic, social network skeptic. Have you changed your mind after these great events in Egypt? Uh, I haven't. Uh, revolutionaries will use whatever tools at their disposal uh, to mobilize, and we've seen it through all previous revolutions. You know, the Bolsheviks made great use of the postal service and the telegraph. The revolution in Iran in 1979 made great use of the tape recorders to smuggle in the sermons uh, by the Ayrolas, right, from Paris. So to me, uh, yes, these tools will be used, uh, and they have been. Right? It doesn't mean that what happens between protests and what happens in periods of relative stability necessarily uh, empowers people, uh, and it doesn't necessarily mean that the Internet overall is a force that favors uh, the oppressed rather than the oppressors. By the way, I just finished your book this morning, and you say in 293 that what those people tried, the social network in 2008, of course was a big failure, and why should we expect anything else? Well, because the conditions on the ground changed, right? Uh, there were plenty of revolutions in Russia which didn't work out in 1917, you know, and before that, in February, but they worked out in October, <laughs> right? So again, the political situation changes all the time. Uh, you saw a lot of protests in Egypt mobilized by Facebook in 2008. Why didn't they work out? Because, again, the situation was different. The army was not probably yet with the protesters, and the geopolitical environment in the region was and different. And yet, uh, Clay, is there an extra role for this weapons of mass mobilization called Twitter and, and YouTube? One of the interesting things about the, the, the countries in the Maghreb, about Tunisia and Egypt, is there was systematic uh, dismantling of the opposition, and yet you still had a world in which people could coordinate to turn out in the streets. You see uh, Libya, you see Gaddafi's government shutting down football games, banning soccer in Libya. 
uh, for the same reasons they're concerned about Facebook or Twitter, which is they're concerned about the coordinating force. The real effect of these tools is going to be measured over years, not over days or weeks. Uh, I have two points to make. On Twitter.com, if they end up selling for billions and billions and billions of dollars, they would have better put most of that into a people's fund in Egypt because that's how their <laughs> stock went up and maybe they could abolish poverty in Egypt. That's number one. Number two, uh, it is truly remarkable what young people did in Egypt, like Asma Mahfouz, the 26-year-old young woman who posted a videotape on her Facebook page that called on people on January 18th to go to Tahrir to stand with her on January 25th, National Police Day, protesting police brutality and how much had happened to the people, especially young people of of Egypt. But we also have a lesson to learn in the United States. It was quite something to see President Obama making a very powerful statement about people's freedom of press, freedom of assembly, and freedom of access to the internet, that we should be guaranteed this. And I think we have to take this lesson to heart at home, because he is not following that path at home uh, when we talk about issues of net neutrality, when we talk about something he promised before he became president, that he would keep the internet open and free. It's not the path he's going down, letting the internet, the video and telecom companies write the legislation that will privatize the internet. That is the greatest threat, I think, right now the in the United States. The thing was that two senators introduced, reintroduced yeah. the idea for internet kill switch bill uh, on the same day that Mubarak cut the internet yes. in Egypt. And, and it tells you about the disconnect between the domestic discussion about internet freedom and the aspirations uh, for how it should be used abroad. We want two rhetorics. We want an internationalist rhetoric and we want a nationalist rhetoric. And it is damaging not just our standing in the world in, 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 in pursuing the idea of one internet, as the secretary said. It's also potentially damaging us at home in, in you know, essentially leading to a condition in which we won't enjoy the freedoms that we're actually asking of the rest of the world. I want to just try one thing, and that is that, that movements, particularly those that are threatening to governments, uh, and then the governments themselves, are going to use in their own time, in their own eras, in their own epochs, whatever tools are available to them, particularly the tools of communication, to fight their revolution and to suppress their revolution from each respective side. This has been true. You can look at it in 1789. You can look at it in this country. And you can look at it in Soviet Union. And you can look at it in Egypt. But now we have tools that operate supersonically. Carl, are they, are they leveling the field between governor and government? Cha they're, they're changing the dynamic. It's, it's, it's a, an eternal game, and usually the suppressive force is on the wrong side. I don't believe that states will be able to successfully titrate how early and how tightly to shut the Internet down. That, uh, that had Egypt gotten in the business of shutting the Internet down when there was a threat of revolution, they would have been shutting it down progressively since 2004. You can't be a modern country if people can't SMS each other. But in Egypt, isn't that what happened? They shut down the internet and they still used various sorts of communications. Yes, and then they shut those down and then they realized they couldn't. Point. And, exactly. and, then, and then they actually printed a newspaper and distributed it by hand. If I ran a newspaper, I would be really worried yeah. because the Egyptian government shut down the internet, then they shut down mobile, then they shut down landlines, and they said to the newspapers, you're fine. <laughs> <laughs> Ultimately, it is people who make these revolutions and rebellions using any tool that they can, whether it's the satellite networks, and Al Jazeera has been key in this. We haven't even talked about that. That's not the Internet. That is just people, finally, a global satellite network, whether or not it can be gotten Al Jazeera English in the United States, which is another whole story that we should have an <laughs> entire show on because it's astounding. This kind of censorship, we have to look at it at every level and challenge it. What has occurred? that is so threatening to despots is the availability to reach so many people so quickly and to permeate borders and to permeate physical things that were impenetrable by airwaves. And now we have these amazing tools that up the ante. So what we've seen in Egypt and Tunisia is this incredible complicity, if you will, between satellite television on the one hand and uh, new media on the other hand. 
in, is this to be applicable now in the global, maybe Arab world, Middle East, and throughout the, throughout the third world? The role of kind of um, corporate media, mainstream media, has to be, if it's going to be you know, true to the mission of journalism, which is holding power to account, actually able to kind of concentrate uh, efforts against exactly these kind of inflection and pressure points in government and in corp corporations which involve the law and involve finance as well as involving government and inv uh, in other words to focus and, and, and put a shoulder to, to the door on some of these. So I think that actually being able to do that is a really key role for the mainstream media because mainstream media is still you know, respected and it has access to government in a way that you know, the internet it doesn't yet have the collective power to do some of those very kind of you know, labour-intensive and resource-intensive um, things. One thing that's very interesting to look at from the 1989 perspective is that we're now looking at a much more compressed time frame. So speed actually is of the essence. So six you, weeks instead of yeah, speed six weeks instead of seventeen six, days. Six, six weeks instead of six months. I mean, it felt like it happened at lightning speed in 1989 in in, in these and it actually did, took six months. Um, and we're seeing that at a much greater speed now. We know that revolutions are highly contagious events, and that they spread very quickly. You know, in 1848, we had a, a series of revolutions in Europe. You know, before television and radio and Twitter. Right? Again, this is not a feature of social media. This is is a feature of how revolutions sprout. It's only 17 days if you discount April 6 of 2008, yeah, and if you're counting from there, it's only two years unless you don't pay attention to Kafaya in 2004. I mean, the 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 public sphere, the densifying of the public sphere in advance of the revolution, matters as much to whether or not an uprising turns into a revolution or not as as the events on the ground. So it is th the long game, the, 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 the long game of the social uh, social environment of a country matters as much, and I think the effect of these tools matters as much for that question of the public sphere as it does for the theater of collapse. So we'll agree that the marriage that's happened between social movements for social justice with social networks has reinvented Egypt as we see it today. Why do we need, I don't know a, def do we need that, a definitive but, answer? to all these questions. Tell us. It's television. Then let's leave it with a question. <laughs> I mean, I mean real questions. Please. Don't you think that especially younger people will always be more advanced in using technology than governments? Well, I mean, look at Iran in 2009, right? There were plenty of young people supplied with technology, right? Again, if you have a lot of thugs out beating them up, uh, no amount of feeding will probably help, right? You do need other forces. You do need to have the army on your side or you know, some other factors. So looking at history, again, it's very useful to look at Facebook-driven revolutions which did not succeed. Again, now in Syria, we see a lot of presence on Facebook. There are a lot of Facebook groups with hundreds of thousands of members. They did not translate into real but world protests. Awesome. You know, what we see are only the success stories. You do not see the failures. And there, there are many more cases, you know, from Belarus, where I come from, to plenty of cases in Central Asia and many of cases in, in the Middle East itself. Also, it's an uprising against, I don't even want to call it mainstream media anymore because I don't think the mainstream media has represented the mainstream. Uh, you know, they have state media in Egypt. In the United States, we don't have state media, but you'd have to ask um, in this country, uh, if we had state media, how would it be any different? <laughs> um, uh, and, uh, <laughs> When you have the protests, February 15, 2003, before the war in Iraq, right, millions of people rocked the globe for peace right before the U.S. attacked um, uh, Iraq. And yet you get, at best, a major picture on the front page of the papers. You see um, millions of people screaming. Most people don't identify with that. But when you hear someone talking, and when was the last time you see these grassroots activists brought into not the mainstream media, but the corporate media's halls to explain themselves, to give a face, a name? It's letting people speak for themselves instead of what we get on all of these networks, um, this small circle of pundits who know so little about so much <laughs> explaining the world to us and getting it so wrong. I, I, want, I want to try to come back at that for Go a minute. Ahead. I just come from three hours of being on the air. The commentary that I heard and what I saw on CNN earlier nights was watched by hundreds of millions of people around the world in all these outlets. 
To say that the coverage was pro-revolutionary would be an understatement. Mm -hmm. To say that there was some kind of corporate tarring of the demonstrators would be wild fantasy. Pearl, you're making a very, very important point, but I just, I also have observed this, how different it is. Because what happened this time in Egypt is that hosts and anchors went to Egypt. They They've were beat up, up. <laughs> what, uh, that from the United States. They were beat up. They were imprisoned. They had their cameras smashed. That and suddenly, the very people, those, those, the people that they usually turn to when they're here, and I'm saying the voices of power, the Mubarak regime, who they would usually be interviewing, they're the ones who beat them up. And so they, for the first time, did not see them as legitimate. And so you started to see in the mainstream media, the corporate media, they're looking for the very voices that we're broadcasting I mean, all the time. Uh, I call it about, trickle up what journalism. About, what about Vietnam? <laughs> what about the press in Vietnam, in particular? You're television? taking us backward. We're going well, to no, move I'm forward. To... <laughs> <laughs> we're going to move forward. We're going to move I mean, to Sudan. Look, actually. We've done some bad Please, things, guys. but All don't tar us for everything we've done. <laughs> Please. I think some of the most important news stories that we've gotten recently have not come from the traditional uh, news outlets. The Neta video has come just um, organically through the internet. And I think the people have kind of shown that they have the ability to say, we see this, this is important, and we're gonna bump it up in importance. And it gets out there within a day. There is simply too much information to, to indulge in the fantasy that you can have unfiltered access to everything. The organic, movement that you're talking about is a form of filtering in which things that get retweeted, reblogged, passed on and sort of rise up, that is simply an alternate form of filtering. But don't believe either that we, c we don't need filters or that we could live without them. Uh, and I don't think that we should be as, I don't think we should be as naively assuming the quality of the organic filters as we were in the 20th century when we simply assumed that Walter Cronkite was when he told us that that's the way it is, that, he was, he, that that statement was at all accurate. But now that we know that that statement is nonsense, we shouldn't also imbue that same sense of, oh, therefore it must be true, when looking at our social network. Go ahead, Emily. Uh, I, I just want to say something sort of slightly in defense of um, uh, our students and also uh, the existing of corporate media and, and of journalism, which is actually uh, being able to relate narrative and data, which is actually going to be a kind of a, a, a relatively difficult job. And I thought the WikiLeaks prism of that was a, a, a great one because, as I say, you just saw the, the future, which is information will come to you in ugly big chunks and you have to be able to make sense of it and you have to be able to make people care about it and actually you know you need people who are paid money to spend time with stories to be able to do that and those are really kind of what professional journalists do please so i guess i'm curious about the role that you think uh, the internet and social media will have moving forward. I mean, obviously, it's been very useful in getting rid of Mubarak and, and mobilizing people around that. But how do you think it can be harnessed and utilized uh, going forward in terms of what happens next in Egypt? I, I had the opportunity to talk to several of the recent Tunisian ministers who were on a panel where they were introduced by their name, their title, and the number of hours they had been in office, <laughs> which, was, which was interesting. Uh, but Sami Zawi, in particular, who was the Secretary of State, and I, I talked to him as the Secretary of State for Communications, and he got his back up. He said, no. In Tunisia, the old Secretary for Communications was, was responsible for stopping communications. I am the Secretary of State for Communications Technology. I'm here to support it. So one of the things we may see in these governments is a commitment to make these tools more directly accessible to their citizens in a less fettered way. The Tunisians are certainly planning on doing that. Whether the Egyptians do or not, I don't know. But, but I, think, I think we could all hope that that would happen. And I can only say on Egypt, uh, I can't think of a more important role for journalists than in this post-Mubarak mm. time. Uh, they are going to be the check and balance on power. It is not predetermined what's going to happen now. It was a people's uprising, but whether it becomes a democratic revolution is going to be determined by holding those in power accountable. Journalists have such an important role to play in Egypt today, and they must be protected, not only in Egypt, but in the United States and around the world. Well, thank you for joining Empire, and until next time.